Good morning, YouTube. This is Dr. Nav coming at you live. I am headed to the hospital right now. It is bright and early. It's like 5.30. You can see it's dark outside. I wanted to share my morning routine with you guys. Usually I wake up, just have some water, brush my teeth, take a shower. I'll meditate, do some breathing exercises, specifically the Wim Hof method. And then I'll jump in my car and I'm ready to go. I usually have my coffee at the hospital. Uh, a few things have changed since COVID started. We're required to wear a mask, so you will see me wearing a mask throughout the day. I carry my N95 with me as well, in case I need it. Once I got that, I'm ready to go, so let's roll. As you can see, it's pitch black, dark on the roads. Our hospital service month, we get about one day off a week. We're on six days in a row. They're usually 12 hour shifts. It's a really, really long month. One of the best things about it is the continuity of care though. There'll be so many patients that I'll admit to the hospital myself. I'll follow their entire course all the way through and then I'll discharge them from the hospital. Um, as a resident, that's one of the most important things you can do, that continuity of care. Some of the cool things about being a family medicine doctor is all of the patients for whom I'm the PCP for, the primary care physician. I see them in the clinic, they follow up on me regularly. I'll admit them, I'll follow their course in the hospital and then I'll discharge them and then they can follow up with me. So the continuity of care is very, very strong in family medicine and, and this type of repetition is, is really awesome. Pulling up in the on-call physician parking, you guys will see a call shift today. So usually the first thing we do when we get here in the morning is we speak with the overnight resident. Uh, they'll tell us about new admissions and any overnight events. Uh, we'll go over pertinent lab findings, pertinent vital signs, any imaging, just basically anything we need to know about the patients. So once we get that, I'll go through my list of patients. I'll have a checklist, then I go around. Meanwhile, I have a to-do list that I've created, just things that I need to follow up on my patients. So I make sure as I'm going throughout the day, I'll make sure I, I go through those to-do lists and I, I check them off. It's a priority list, so usually, you know, top priority. If I need to call consults or if I need to uh, put in specific orders, I do all that stuff first and then I work on my notes afterward. Eventually, we come together as a team and we discuss a plan for the rest of the day for these patients. This is a usual workflow that we go through every single morning. Since I'm the one on call today with our pager, I'll be getting any calls on any of our patients. So if there's like a rapid response called or just any questions the nurses may have, uh, I answer those. I keep this pager on me all day. I take any new admissions that come from the ER. We take downgrades from the ICU as well. Sometimes we'll get direct admissions from outlying hospitals that are a little bit smaller. So, you know, I'm on the lookout for those throughout the day as things go. Running on my patients right now, taking these stairs, to make sure I get these steps in. One of the best things about our service is the diverse pathology we see. So you'll see uh, cardiac related, lung related, GI related, kidney related illnesses, a lot of skin related illnesses, a lot of drug overdoses. So uh, a lot of the bread and butter has to do with that. And me being on call today, um, it's one of the best places to learn because you get the most exposure, you take all the admissions, and you do some of the discharges. What's up fam? So I just finished my morning rounds after I pre-chart out my patients. I went downstairs, saw my patients, did a proper physical exam, spoke to them about their, their diagnosis and their hospital course. I love speaking with each of my nurses as well, just to address any of their concerns. After I did that, uh, I'm back here now. I'm just gonna be working on my notes and kind of getting a plan in place before interdisciplinary rounds. So basically, uh, I'm probably gonna be rounding here uh, with my with my team in about an hour or so. So I got a little bit of downtime. So with interdisciplinary rounds, I have my attending doctor. I have three co-residents. We usually have a pharmacist and a case manager as well. Um, we'll discuss and have a game plan in place as a team for those patients. As many of you will know, I can't get into exact detail of what patients I'm seeing and 
know, what I'm treating and show you videos of all that stuff because patient privacy is number one in medicine and being HIPAA compliant is important. So what I'm going to be doing is sharing with you the most common conditions that a hospitalist sees on the general floors and the IMC or intermediate care unit floors. Typically, you'll see things like septicemia, which can be a life-threatening complication from any type of infection. You see heart failure, heart attacks, cardiac dysarrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation. Uh, syncopal episodes are pretty common. It's another word for passing out. Uh, you see a lot of COPD, treatment of pulmonary embolisms or blood clots, pneumonia, GI bleeds, acute kidney injuries, chronic kidney disease complications like missing dialysis, cancer, strokes. Another common thing is complications from diabetes like DKA, HHS, infections that can lead to amputations. Complications secondary to alcohol abuse are very common. You'll range from chronic malnutrition, uh, vitamin deficiencies, to acute bleeds like esophageal varices or hemorrhoids. And it's very common to see decompensated liver disease, which leads to fluid overload. Ascites typically needs to be tapped. You see pancreatitis. You gotta look out for uh, alcohol withdrawal signs and symptoms, which can be as bad as delirium tremens, which can include seizures, refeeding syndrome, a new addition to all of this is COVID positive patients, typically those that are having new onset requirement of oxygen or COVID pneumonia can be admitted to the general or IMC floors under isolation precautions. If they begin experiencing rapid respiratory compromise, they'll be sent to the ICU for additional resources. So general hospitalists will see a broad range of pathology, uh, which include but is not limited to these that I've mentioned. So now, in the meantime, while I got some downtime, I'm going to finish these notes and then we're going to do rounds. So I just finished rounds and I ordered some lunch. So one of the first things I did after the first month on our service was I stopped eating the cafeteria food because it's not good food, it's not healthy. So I try to eat majority plant-based. This here that you're looking at is kale and arugula. Um, you'll see some sprouts, some black beans, some corn, some pickled red cabbage, a little bit of kimchi. Some lime cilantro sauce. I put some avocado in here and there's some tuna. All right, so I just got my first page from the ER, as you guys saw. I'm just about to chart prep on this patient, just to make sure I'm not missing anything. So once I've chart prepped, I'm gonna go downstairs and I'm gonna go see the patient in the ER and I'll keep you posted. So as I'm preparing for this first admission, I actually just got another page from the ED. It looks like I have two admissions down there waiting for me. Uh, now typically if I start falling behind like this, again, my goal is to pre-chart on the patients and then I'll go see both of them at the same time. One of the things I like to do in my pre-charting is I'll go into our outpatient records. Uh, the patients that we admit to our family medicine service are patients that we see at our family medicine center outpatient. So uh, by printing a snapshot of that, I'm able to see who their primary care doctor is, uh, what issues uh, the primary care doctor might be working on with the patient, and uh, the up-to-date medication list, stuff like that. So. Um, I'll have that snapshot printed, I'll review it, so that way when I go down to see the patient in the emergency department, uh, I'll know a little bit about them and um, we can go from there. And one thing I do wanna do is do a clinical vignette with you guys, just to give you an example of stuff that I see and the thought processes that I might have. So let's do a random example of hemoptysis, which is the patient maybe coughing up blood. So say down in the ER, there's a patient coughing up blood and they need to be admitted. One of the funner parts of all this is being an investigator and trying to get to the root cause of this hemoptysis. So 
I'm going down a differentials list in my head. Could this be COPD, bronchitis, pneumonia? Is the patient on blood thinners? Could it be a pulmonary embolism or possibly cancer? A very detailed history and physical exam are crucial in this entire workup. Obtaining a past medical history, family history, social history that would include occupation, and exposure to toxins or hazardous materials. Are they a smoker? Do they do drugs? Do they drink alcohol? On physical exam, you wanna check their oral cavity, uh, make sure they're not choking on the blood. Can they protect their airway? Do they need to be intubated? Check for blunt trauma. Check all four of their extremities for a pulse. Make sure they're adequately perfusing all of their tissues. Are they anemic? Listen to the lungs. Other questions I might ask is, is this the first time it's happened? Uh, how long has it been going on? Is it intermittent or persistent? Is there any pain, back pain, shortness of breath? Have you had fatigue or weight loss? Any cough or night sweats? So once I'm down there, I've seen the patient, I've evaluated them, I can decide what type of workup is necessary. And this can include chest x-ray, CT scans, MRIs, and different labs and even possibly contacting the lung doctors or the pulmonologists to do a bronchoscopy, which is where you take a camera down the actual lung to be able to see what's going on. So it's pretty fun being an investigator. And this is also why I always say that a general hospitalist is like the quarterback. They can get different specialists on board depending on what the situation is, and they coordinate the entire care of a patient during their course in the hospital. Making my way out from the ER. So we're gonna end up admitting both of the patients. Basically what happens is I will do the HPI history and physical. I did my physical exams, I'll double check their medications, make sure that their medicines are up to date. And once I have a full plan in place, I call my attending. Got some action tonight, the last time we spoke. I got one more admission and then got a consult from ortho. And then now I've got a patient who might get a rapid call from acute respiratory distress. So I'm racing down the stairs on my way there now. Let's talk about a rapid response and what we typically do in this situation. Hospital staff can call upon me at any time to provide critical care expertise at the bedside of one of our patients whose condition might be deteriorating. There are often clear early warning signs of deterioration. The physician's job is to identify these and determine the next step in stabilizing the patient, whether that's acute measures um, that may help or transferring the patient to the critical care unit for additional resources. A retrospective multi-site cohort study published in Critical Care Medicine in October 2019 examined the most frequent event triggers that lead to rapid responses. According to this analysis, respiratory issues was at the top of the list. This can include decreased oxygen saturations, new onset difficulty breathing, tachypnea, or respiratory depression. Cardiovascular issues was also at the top of the list, uh, which can include tachycardia, hypotension, hypertension, chest pain that might be unresponsive to nitroglycerin, bradycardia also, neurologic issues as well, which can include altered mental status, acute loss of consciousness, seizures, a suspected stroke, agitation, and delirium. In my experience, Blood glucose issues is also common and a medication side effects is too. Typically when I show up on the floor, I'll assess the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation, the ABCs. Common things I may order during one of these rapids include, but is not limited to, a point of care blood sugar, a stat EKG, a lactic acid, which can show tissue hypoperfusion, all forms of shock have high lactic acid levels and sometimes this might give you a tip that the patient might be headed towards that direction. Recall different types of shock can include cardiogenic, hypovolemic, anaphylactic, septic, and neurogenic. You might order a chest x-ray, do a bolus. In cases of increased oxygen requirement, you may throw the patient on a nasal cannula, a non-rebreather mask, high flow, CPAP, BiPAP, or sometimes they might even require intubation. 
If they have bradycardia, you might give some atropine. Sometimes the mean arterial pressure of a patient can drop below 65. Sometimes that requires pressors and an ICU consult. So it's really different in every situation. So hope you found that segment on rapid responses useful. This rapid I went down to luckily uh, did not turn into an emergency. Uh, no need to upgrade to the ICU or anything like that. So that's a positive. So, so far today I've gotten three admissions, one consult, and uh, this one rapid. One of the things we like to do uh, when we get a little bit of downtime is to run the list. Since we all did uh, rounds together around midday, we all have a to-do list um, that we need to make sure is complete. So we'll all kind of follow up on that together. And my senior resident is kind of responsible for making sure that all the to-do list on all the patients is completed. So right now it is around 4 p.m. Uh, typically around this time, I like to get some of my co-residents home. It is the resident who's on call. It's my responsibility to be here until 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., we have a night resident that comes on and they're responsible for taking care of our patients from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. As the on-call resident, one of my responsibilities is you know, if I send one of my co-residents home to get some rest, since we all kind of run this marathon through the month, the rest is very important. I will have them sign out their patients to me. I'll assume responsibility for them. And then when the night resident gets here around 6 p.m., I sign out the patients to them. And one of the last things I want to be able to discuss with you guys, super important in hospital medicine and family medicine and continuity of care, is the patient disposition. And that's where will the patient go after their hospitalization? Typically, we have a group of teams that works on this together to coordinate care. Teams include the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the case workers, and the patient care facilitators, and sometimes even an ethicist. An ethicist is a PhD doctorate in ethics. They're absolutely amazing at being able to help us during our family meetings. Sometimes uh, between the medical team and the families, you have meetings to discuss goals of care, end of life care, and other sticky situations. So they're great at moderating in those situations so we can all come to a mutual decision together. The reason this is important, so going back to disposition, some patients, uh, they get better and then they can go straight home. Others, they might have gotten weaker. For example, if they spent a lot of time in the ICU or if they are dealing with acute fractures or something that's gonna require physical therapy or occupational therapy, um, sometimes that'll need to be coordinated outpatient, which extends their care outside of the hospital. Another example is our elderly patients. Uh, sometimes they come in, they've had a fall, um, they've gotten a lot weaker, um, they might be living at home, and now we discuss with the family and they're not comfortable with them living at home anymore. This is one of the heartbreaking aspects of, of hospital medicine. And typically what we'll do there is try and set them up at an extended care facility, like a nursing home, and also to be able to get them physical therapy and occupational therapy. Being able to coordinate that care and making sure that the patients get to where they need to get to is important. And then, you know, for, for me, myself, being a family medicine physician, making sure our patients can follow up with us outpatient. So, you know, being able to follow their course here and knowing what's going on, but then seeing them at their hospital follow up and uh, making sure that we are able to kind of close the loop on that. As I grow as a physician, I've learned how important that is because ultimately uh, preventative care, you can prevent hospitalizations, which I, I believe is the ultimate goal of a primary care physician. This is a very, very important aspect of medicine and it was something that I didn't used to think about. ending to a very, very long day. I'm on my way home. Um, so one of the most important things to me while I'm on the service is to make sure that I'm exercising. Uh, my goal is five times a week and I typically hit that goal. I am gonna share with you guys uh, how I did this month just to be able to provide some inspiration. Uh, and the fact that you shouldn't be making excuses. You know, um, if I'm putting in 80 hours a week and I'm able to get it in at least five times, uh, I don't think anybody out there should be making excuses and in investing in themselves. Um, and I wanna end this on a strong note. So 80% of the disease in the United States can be prevented if people were to exercise properly, to eat 
healthy, which means majority plant-based whole foods. You can still have lean meats in that. Um, and didn't smoke, literally. This was a study published uh, by Harvard um, on over 100,000 people that proved that 80% of the disease in America could be prevented just by those three things. And again, that's exercise, eat right, and don't smoke. Um, so with this, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, video log. Um, I really enjoyed making it for you guys. So please uh, comment any questions below. If you guys enjoyed this, uh, you know, give me some suggestions on what more you'd like to see and I'd be more than happy to create stuff like that. Uh, and again, please subscribe to the YouTube channel um, so you could get notifications whenever I put out a new video and help us at 100,000. All right, guys, much love. Uh, thank you so much for all the support. Um, seriously, it keeps me going in residences.